Can you stay for a few minutes? You, well, sure. Gary Webb is on the line from sure. uh, San Jose, and if you want to stay and talk about this article, sure. I, I need some I need right. some help here. Right. Uh, Gary Webb, are you there this morning? Yeah, I am. Good morning. Good morning to you. How are you? Very tired. Uh, early out here. I apologize. You're really nice to do this. We've had so many calls about this, is why we ask you to do it. Well, I'm happy to talk about it. I actually heard you on a radio station when I was in Detroit a couple weeks ago uh, for about an hour talking about this. This is what it's all about. It's the San Jose Mercury News, and here's a front page piece in August the, 8th, August the 18th, and it's the first of a three part series. Tell us, uh, you know, in a, a couple minutes, what this is about. It's about, a, it's about a drug ring that operated in uh, San Francisco and Los Angeles in the mid-80s. And um, it, was, it was connected to a Nicaraguan uh, anti-communist army called the FDN, which was one of the biggest groups that we know as a Contras. And it was uh, selling cocaine um, in Los Angeles for the most part, but in other areas of the country as well, um, to, to the gangs, to the Crips and Bloods. Uh, down in Los, down in South Central Los Angeles, and they were taking the money and using some of it. Um, I don't know how much. We haven't figured that out yet. Uh, to to buy weapons for the Contras, um, and you know, I know, I know it sounds, I know it sounds crazy. I know it sounds like the wildest conspiracy theories, uh, which is why all our supporting documentation for the thing is posted on the internet. And if anybody's interested, I can give you the internet address a little later on. Yeah, um, we've got a. Uh, from the Mercury News here, a, a big chart that you put together from the Sunday story. Did you write all this, by the way? Yes, I did. This is a chart that shows how the, the money left down around Columbia. And the, can you give us a little bit of this scenario uh, on how these I'm not looking at a television right now, but I, I, is that the pipeline chart? It is. Uh, yeah. Those were the various smuggling routes that the, that the ring used um, starting in the late 70s up to the early 90s. Um, to get the cocaine into the country and to get the money, some of the money back out of the country, um, and it depend, you know, depending on the year and depending on the uh, the, you know, how, how intense the police uh, scrutiny was, which wasn't very for the most part. That, those are the different routes they used. They used uh, freighters. They used stolen cars. Um, wow. They would just fly the stuff in in suitcases uh, in early on when you didn't bring very much in. Let me read you the, the first one up here, which is right near Los Angeles. It says. Mid-1970s, luxury cars stolen in California were driven to Nicaragua, where they were officially imported by the Nicaraguan military to avoid stiff excise taxes and sold to wealthy Managuans. Right. The second uh, number, which is way down here in Peru, it says, mid-late 1970s, Peruvian cocaine was smuggled to Panama, secreted in suitcases and shoes with false bottoms and carried into the U.S. by airline passengers. Points of entry included San Francisco, Los Angeles, Houston, and New Orleans. The third one is late 1970s to 83, cocaine from the new Cali cartel in Colombia was loaded onto freighters owned by the Gran Colombian Line. The freighters were offloaded in the ports of Los Angeles, San Francisco, Portland, and Seattle. Four, early 1980s, cocaine was flown from Colombia to the Bahamas, where it was loaded aboard small planes and flown into Miami. From there, couriers would take it to California aboard commercial airliners. Right. Now, I can go on about this, but where did you get the new information? Um, you know, it's it's been public record for for uh, you know twenty years almost. It was just from court files. I mean, eventually, once in a while, they would catch one of these people. The DEA would file an affidavit and lay out what they knew about the drug rings operations. And it came from you know a lot of stuff in national archives, mostly uh, a lot of these old court cases. And then there were cases in Nicaragua, which laid out the smuggling routes. Uh, through that country into the United States, so we had the back end of it as well. Uh, Gary Webb, uh, Jack Nelson is at the table. I do want to tell the audience something because right over your head, you can't see that. Look up on that screen there when we have it. It looks like there's a crack in the window, but that's actually condensation on our window back here because it's so muggy and it comes right down Jack's head. So I wanted to let Yeah, you wouldn't know. believe how muggy it can get here in Washington. <laughs> oh, yes, I can. Yes, I can. Uh, Jack. Uh, Nelson asked a question. Well, yeah, I was uh, going to ask you because I haven't read the series. It looks fantastic, but uh, uh, what about the CIA involvement in, in all of this? Is that? Uh, well, the, the that that part of the story deals with the the FDN, that the guerrilla army that, mm -hmm. I, that I mentioned earlier. Right. That was, you know, as the Iran Contra hearings documented pretty right. well. That was a creation of the CIA. Right. And we track the uh, cocaine dealers who were running this operation all the way up the ladder to um, a cut the. the a couple of CIA agents that were actually running the FDN, mm -hmm. uh, Enrique Bermudez and Adolfo Calero. And um, a lot, let me, let me tell you as a bit of background, 
most of this information, or much of the information, came out at a trial in San Diego in March. One of the uh, one of the cocaine brokers, a guy named Danilo Blandone, who was the head of the Southern California operation, uh, has been working for the U.S. government for the last couple of years, mm-hmm. and um, he was uh, the star witness in a, in a cocaine trafficking trial for the DEA in in uh, San Diego. And a lot of this stuff came out under cross examination when he was up on the witness stand because uh, you know the defense was curious, uh, to say the least, about his relationship with the Contras. Um, and the Crips, and um, unfortunately, they couldn't really get into a lot of it because before the trial, the United States filed a motion asking that nobody be allowed to ask Mr. Blandone about his relationship with the CIA. Um, and it was one of the most curious documents I'd ever seen. It said, "If true, this matter would be classified, and if false, it shouldn't be allowed at the trial." So, did I you never get really it? Yeah. had a chance to quiz him in great, very detail about his relationship. There. Did you get any help at all out of the CIA? Uh, at, at any during the investigation, mm-hmm. absolutely not. They wouldn't even return my phone calls. Mm-hmm. I mean, I filed a Freedom of Information Act request for information on um, Blandone and his boss Norman Manessis, and I was told that uh, they can't tell me anything because it's a matter of national security. Gary, where, where are you from originally? My dad was in the Marines, so I'm from everywhere. And how long have you been with the San Jose Mercury News? I've been with the Mercury eight years. I was with the Cleveland Plain Dealer five years before that. Where did you go to college? I went to college in uh, Indiana for, for a year, and then I went to college in Kentucky. We're at Indiana University? Yeah, IU in Indianapolis, with Community College. And uh, I had a scholarship there, and then my dad got transferred, and uh, I ended up at Northern Kentucky University. We're going to take a call in a moment, but in your stories also, you say that the Crips and the Bloods, the, uh, the, gang in, uh, the gangs in uh, yeah. L.A. get involved in this. How? That's the back end of the deal. That's who was buying the cocaine, and they were... They were buying cocaine and they were buying weapons from these fellows. How, to how much? Can you give us some sense of how big this thing is? Um, well, you know, I, one of the guys that talked to me was, uh, was the guy who was buying it, a fellow named Freeway Rick Ross. Um, he was the biggest crack wholesaler in Los Angeles during the 1980s. And he says, well, he and Danilo Blandone have, have both said that, you know, at their peak they were doing 100 kilos a week. Um, and that's just, for, that's just with one dealer. You know, I don't know how, how much Blandone was selling to other people, but with Rick Ross, he was selling at least 100 kilos a week by 1984, 1985. Let's take a call, and Jack Nelson's here at the desk with us, and we'll ask both of you gentlemen to get involved. Wilmington, Delaware, go ahead, please. Uh, good morning. I'm a little nervous because this is my first time. That's all right. <laughs> Join the club. <laughs> but if, you, if you remember, uh, during the CIA Contra hearings, when Ollie North and uh, President Reagan and all those other people were, were uh, having this war in Nicaragua, uh, this information came out then, but it was just you know put under the rug. But uh, it's, it was a well-known fact at the time that the CIA was using gangs in California and various parts of the country, black groups, and they would bring drugs into the United States, and they are part of the reason why the drug situation is the way it is today, because they infiltrated the country with all these drugs so that they could get the money, because Congress would not appropriate money for us to carry on that war in Nicaragua. Where is so it? they had to get money from some place to, to finance the war. But what about right now, though? Where, what do you think the situation is? I ask all of you, what's the status of uh, this kind of drug running today? Gary well, Webb? I don't know what the situation is now, but the, the CIA is one of the reasons why the situation is what it is today. All right, thanks, caller. Uh, Mr. Webb, what do you say? Uh, about, about today, whether this, whether this liaison exists today, right? I don't know. Um, I mean, I found that they, these guys were deep buying and selling from the same sources up until 1992, when Blandone was finally arrested uh, by the DEA. So, I mean, it was going on at least until '92. What do you think? My guess is not. I mean, I wouldn't. Uh, I mean, I can't believe, for example, that. Uh, uh, Judge William Webster, who I've known for a long time, who was CIA director, uh, would not have tried to put a stop to anything like that when he was CIA director, and that uh, Mr. Deutsch, the pre- uh, current CIA director, uh, I can't believe that he would uh, that he would well, put up with something. No, like I, that. I'm not saying that the CIA is necessarily involved. In no, I know you're not. I, no, I know you're not saying yeah. that. Yeah, but I, but I'm just saying I don't I don't think so. That was an answer to Brian's question. I know you didn't say that, Gary. Well, in, in some later uh, items here on your pipeline chart, it says in the late 1980s, Colombian cocaine was flown aboard private planes into small airfields in northern Costa Rica and southern Nicaragua. Super DC-3s leaving from San Jose, Costa Rica, loaded with general merchandise, would touch down briefly, take a, on a cocaine load, and continue on to U.S. airports. 
Spring. Right. That came out of the trial that in Nicaragua. Spring. Uh, Norwin Manessis, the guy who was running this drug ring. Thanks. Uh, Springfield, Missouri, you're next. Yeah, uh, Brian, I'm really disappointed in you. I really am. Uh, the whole theme of this is that the CIA w was w was was bringing or was uh, supplying the uh, the Contras with guns uh, and 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 financing it off of drugs. Is that the theme? And the only the only the only source we have for this is some some questionable character. This is like the Gary Sick thing all over. And, well, and let me let me. Have you read the series? No, I I have okay, well, not. Well, that's not the only source. That's the only source we've talked about. That's the only source you've talked about. Right. We we had we had like seven or eight independent sources on this stuff and contemporaneous. Yeah, but you you have provided any archives. names? Pardon? No names. Well, where do you want me to start? Well, I'll start. You've got Sergeant Tom stories. Gordon who filed an affidavit in Los Angeles in 1986. Huh? Was, was I correct on the theme of this whole thing, that, that the CIA was supplying the Contras with guns and financing the whole thing off of, off of drugs? No, that's not correct. Well, that's, I mean, they were that's, certainly supplying with guns. They weren't financing the whole thing off of drugs. They were financing part of it off of drugs. Part of it. Well, part's even bad. But Well, I tend to agree. But uh, I don't know. It, I'm I'm disappointed in Brian. He, he he puts experts on for the for for scandals for for uh, for uh, uh, he hadn't put any experts that that know about scandals for 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 for, for Clinton. But yet he puts on these stupid eighty scandals. Still, I mean, he's back in the past. I call it, call it, let, hold on, just a second. Well, I tell you, hey, let me, uh, I don't Gary think Webb, that community in Los Angeles thinks it's a stupid scandal. Let me just tell the caller why this gentleman's on here. It's because caller after caller kept calling up and referring to this whole subject. It seems the first thing you do is you go to the source and ask what it's all about, and then we can continue talking about this. I don't blame you for being upset. We haven't, we can't deal with this thing in fifteen minutes. That's White House to put this. You back. Oh, now, 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 there's, now, there's one. There's see, there's one of your Democrat calls. Republican, the, Democrat Republican. There's no yeah. caller. There's not even this. We haven't talked to the White House forever in this yeah. whole thing. This yeah. Well, who did you bow to? Somebody's pressure. We didn't bow to anybody's let pressure. The calls come as they come. We did. Uh, oh, he's upset about the calls. That you're right. No, the Democrat, Republican, Democrat, Republican. Why don't you just let the calls? You say that the callers. This guy's are got a political agenda. Program. I don't care if he's got a political agenda, but he's upset because we split the call lines. Gary uh, Webb, you want to talk some more about uh, your sources on this thing? And who will not talk? Who just well, absolutely won't talk? The, uh, the C uh, we filed Freedom of Information Act requests with the CIA, and, and as I said, those were, those were denied on national security grounds. We filed them with the DEA, and for the first time in my life, I think, the DEA came out and said, no, we don't want to give you any records because we're concerned about invading the privacy of these drug dealers, so we don't want to tell you about them. Um, so they didn't give us anything. The FBI uh, sent me a letter saying it might be two years before they got around to answering my request. Uh, the INS has never responded. The State Department has gotten the stuff and never responded. I mean, so, and they, these have been filed for like six, eight months. And then we tried asking the DEA questions, and we couldn't get any answer from them. The only thing the CIA says is it's ludicrous, which, you know, I'm, I'll be the first to agree. The idea of them selling drugs to the Contras, and the, for the Contras and the Crips, is, is, is ludicrous. But everything we saw said it was true. Let's grab a call from Dayton, Ohio. Go ahead, please. Hi. Uh, the one question that no one's asked yet, and I'm going to ask it and see if this guy gives us an honest answer. Were these drugs targeted to black people? I don't think they were targeted like in in the manner that you mean. They were targeted in in so far as you know Danilo Blandone, the man who was who was sent to to Los Angeles to sell these drugs. He had a master's degree in marketing. That was his job before the revolution. He was in charge of setting up wholesale markets for Nicaraguan agricultural produce. He came to the United States and testified. And at the, again, it, it, it he isn't the only one that says this, but he said this under oath while as a, while a government witness. He wasn't trying to beat a rap. He wasn't trying to reduce a sentence. He's a free man. And he came into court and testified to this under oath. And uh, what he said was that he was schooled in San Francisco in the drug trade. It took him two days to teach him how to become a cocaine dealer. He went down to Los Angeles and didn't know what to do. And when you talk to his friends and you talk, look at the documents that exist, what happened apparently was you know, the guy's a marketing expert. He looked around, he saw where it wasn't being sold, and went to sell it there. 
I mean, and I think it was as simple as that. And I don't think anybody really cared particularly where he got the money as long as he got it. Uh, we're about, we're going to get time for at least one more call. But I want to ask you because the caller who was upset about this being uh, set up by the White House, let me bring in the MENA Arkansas story that uh, the Wall Street Journal spent a lot of time on. Well, I, we, we wrote about that the other day. Um, How does that fit in with all this? I mean, see, this was, MENA was a parallel, MENA was part of a parallel operation that was going on on the East Coast, which is why if people think they've heard about this before, it's because they heard about the East Coast pipeline when it was uncovered back in 85 and 86. By, but, but I want to make the connection with uh, the, the current president. Is, he was supposedly involved as a he, governor? Well, he was governor while this was going on. Whether or not he knew about it is, is something I don't think has been proven yet. Let me ask Jack Nelson about this. Do you, do you, pay, do you pay attention to that mean Arkansas story? Well, we've, we've uh, written what was there, but I mean, there's no indication that, uh, that uh, Clinton as governor had anything to do with it. I mean, it's been, it's been written about uh, with uh, all sorts of speculation by a lot of right-wing publications, but I've never seen anything that, uh, that uh, indicated any complicity on the part of the president. Gary Webb, if people want to get a copy of this, uh, I understand that you have reprints for a small fee. I, I think actually they decided to make it free, but it's, you can call 408-920-5999, or you can download the whole thing from the Internet. Um, and with, all, with all our documentation, with, with sound clips, so you can hear Danilo Blandon testifying to this in his own words. Uh, and you can get that at www.sjmercury.com slash drugs. That's the best version, actually. All right, let's do that one again so that people can okay. write it down. www.sjmercury.com Com. slash drugs. Drugs and uh, if again that telephone number if you want it and I assume there's no one there now. Well, there might be a machine there now. You can leave a name and number. Four zero eight nine two zero five nine nine nine. Are you alleging in any of this that the Republicans had anything to do with this as a party? No, I mean we we tried to stay, I tried to stay as far out of partisan politics on this story as I could. And just tell a story about a drug operation. Um, you know, we we mentioned obviously that Reagan was in power when he authorized uh, this this secret war down there, but you know Clinton's in power now, and that, those are the folks who put Danilo Blandone on the federal payroll. I mean, the guy that brought crack to L.A. is now a federal government employee. All right, Virginia Beach, Virginia, go ahead, please. Yes, concerning the Arkansas involvement in the drug thing, uh, ever since 1986, Bill Clinton as governor did not ride herd on this thing. But all the, drug, all the drugs came through Mena, Arkansas. Everybody knows that and reads it in the papers. Barry Seal was doing it. Uh, Barry Seal was killed. Clinton didn't really have anything to do with it except he knew about it, gave auspice to it, wrote her on it, and his government bond program received 10% of the profits, plus all the money was able to be laundered through Arkansas banks. All right, thanks. Mr. Webb. That's, uh, that's a lot of the allegations around Mina, and a, and a lot of what she said is true, um, that, that Barry Seal was, I mean, he was one of the biggest drug dealers in the country at the time, and that's where, his, that's where he was based out of. Mr. Nelson, um, Freedom of Information Act, has it made any difference? Uh, yes, in some cases it has. I mean, uh, we've been able to get files from the FBI in some cases. I did, for the book, I got a lot of my information uh, that I did on uh, Terror in the Night, Clan's campaign against the Jews. What about that, Mr. Webb? Do you... The, the, the one we had that worked, which, I mean, sort of cemented the story for us, was the Freedom of Information Act that we filed with the National Archives. And those folks over there released some FBI documents that had been classified for about 10 years um, regarding regarding this drug ring and regarding this operation and we got him out of the the files of iran contra special prosecutor lawrence walsh I mean, these are some of the fbi reports that were done either prior to the walsh investigation as part of something else or or as part of the walsh investigation let's go to newport rhode island next go ahead please all right yes so mr webb this is a very interesting conversation you should also check at the national archives uh the recently released documents on the board of economic warfare from world war ii which uh, was um, founded by William Casey, who worked, uh, it, who was a part of the old OSS. Yeah. And uh, uh, they they began by purchasing the uh, the first crop of opium that they purchased. The entire crop from Turkey was 1943. Lucky Luciano moved to uh, was deported to Naples after he helped uh, with the invasion of Sicily. Luciano began his opera, his heroin trafficking 
from Turkey uh, through uh, Naples, Sicily, this, and this Cuba. This is all in those files? Yeah. All, uh, no, the, the uh, preemptive buys, uh, what the Board of Economic Warfare was about. Um, the reason why I'm interested in it is... Uh, some characters in your part of the country were on the Board of Economic Warfare at that, okay? And right. so, um, and I, I'll, I'll, uh, anyway, so um, it's been going on for a long, long time. And uh, it's, and then, of course, it's lo a logical uh, thing that Casey would be involved in this uh, 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 type of operation in the 1980s. Thanks. Mr. Uh, well, well, it sounds like Gary's got himself another story there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got. Or, or if somebody done, if, I was going to say if somebody doesn't beat you to it, Gary. But it did sound interesting <laughs> yeah. what she said. Now, this yeah. isn't the best way to get a story, right? <laughs> well, you know, when you sit and listen to everybody on this thing, you start to hear all the conspiracy theories. Well, do, have they come to you in, in a big way? I mean, you find people coming out of the woodwork because they're uh, they follow these kind of things. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's that's sort sort of one of the risks of doing this kind of story, and and frankly. I mean, the, the thing that gave us the, the sort of, uh, you know, intestinal fortitude to do this, because we realize this is a very controversial story. This is, like, almost impossible to believe, believe when you look at it. But we've got this tool now called the World Wide Web where you can, you can show people the documents you, can, you used. I mean, we, you can click on a, you can read the story, and if it says set a report, you can click on the word report and actually read the report. If we've got a quote in there and, and it's highlighted, you can hear it and actually read the report. If we've got a quote in there and it's, and it's highlighted, you can hear what these folks said. So, you know, and ma you know, make up your own minds. Don't take my word for it. You know, and nobody knows who I am. You know, when I was listening to that radio station, I don't even remember which radio station. And don't mention it, please, because I'm going to say something that, that that they won't like. You were set up before you got on in a way you probably didn't even know about. The You're way probably that, right. And I just wondered how often. I mean, the, the 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 fellow that was the host had an agenda. He talked about you in a specific way, and by the time you got on, I was listening, thinking, I wonder if Mr. Webb has any idea what he's been saying before you got on the air. No, I have none. <laughs> Tell me about it. Well, I, you know, I can't hear on the air because I don't, I don't remember the name, I don't remember the okay. station, and I don't want to say anything that uh, would be, but what I, mean, he, I can't remember. But all what he did was sandbag him, is that right? Well, not necessarily, because he was very much in favor of what he had done. Oh, oh <clears> So I it was just, but it was in a certain uh, way that he set it up, and, and you got the distinct impression he was just you know, overwhelmingly delighted that you had done this and for a lot of political reasons mm -hmm. that he was talking about. Mm -hmm. Let's take one more call for you and then we'll let you go. Lawrenceburg, Tennessee, go ahead, please. Yeah, good morning, Brian. Morning. Hey, it's a thrill to get through to you guys. Uh, I've had the TV turned down so long I've probably lost track of the conversation. So <laughs> your screener said turn the set down. Uh, one of the things that had caught my interest uh, when you first brought the gentleman on about the investigation of the CIA involvement in the drug trafficking in Los Angeles was when you uh, showed his chart, which uh, I understand he couldn't see at the time, it showed all the different points uh, where the drugs had entered the country, and uh, I couldn't read the chart well enough to know if uh, the area down there around the Gulf included Mena, Arkansas or not. Uh, you know, this uh, Mena, Arkansas thing has uh, been going on. Uh, that accusation's been made now ever since Clinton came into office, uh, especially. Uh, tying him and uh, Don Lassiter and the other gentleman that uh, right. was the uh, supposedly the head man in that part of the country. So uh, well, you, it, it we've talked all tied together. You know, we've talked about it, and uh, I'll let Mr. Webb answer you. Go ahead. A Dick. Actually, actually, to give you a bit of background, I mean, Mena just became an issue since Clinton became president, but the information has been available since the Kerry Committee did its investigation back in 87 and 88. A lot of what I know about Mena came from reading the report, free, reading from reading the report of that investigation. Um, as I said, you know they were on to this East Coast uh, Contra pipeline, which they exposed uh, pretty well. For some reason, that report just never had any resonance with the, with the media. What's your follow up on all this? You know, obviously now uh, with things going, on, Deutsch has asked for an investigation uh, from the CIA Inspector General. That's one one thing we're looking at. There is a lot of talk, especially among the Congressional Black Caucus, about doing hearings on this thing, which is which is another issue. Uh, and and then there's a, then you know you get the role of the DEA and the Justice Department in this thing, and and, Bar and Barbara Boxer and Diane Feinstein have both asked for investigations on that. So there's a number of investigations going on in Washington that we're going to be following. Gary Webb, 5 a.m. out there. Thanks a lot for getting up and telling us about this. Sure, glad glad to be here. And uh, as we we'll give out the telephone number one more time, if you want to get the documents, 408-920-5999.
in your life of, uh, as a journalist, what articles have you written that got the most impact? I mean, where's, you know, he's talking about hearings happening and all this kind of stuff, CIA director getting involved. Well, I guess the most impact I had was a series I did on a mental institution, the largest mental institution in the world in uh, Milledgeville, Georgia, which had uh, 12,500 patients and 2,500 more on an outpatient basis. And I, I did a series of stories that showed that uh, the chief surgeon there was, uh, was uh, away from the hospital at times while a nurse was, who was his uh, close friend uh, was performing major surgery on patients where another dr doctor was uh, giving experimental drugs to mental patients uh, where they only spent $2.52 a day for the care, feeding, and, and housing of, uh, of uh, each mental patient. I mean, it was a, it was a snake pit. And uh, there was a big investigation later, and uh, they fired a bunch of people, including the superintendent of the hospital, and uh, had a big mental health reform there. So that probably was the most... Uh, Thanks uh, for staying know. later. Yeah. I'm, get, gl get, get. I'm glad. I'm glad I got here on time. We got, we got an hour and five minutes out of you. Thank yeah. you very much, Jack Nelson, yeah. who is the chief uh, Washington correspondent for the LA Times, and uh, Charlie Peters and Ken Tomlinson up next after a short break.